some of us are studying in a growth group what what the apostle paul has to say about the holy spirit using uh, this book by gordon fee well i would recommend it actually it's good stuff he suggests that for many of us our creed a statement of what we believe might be a bit like this we believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth we believe in jesus christ his son but we're not so sure about the holy spirit and i think that's understandable we can get our head around god as a father and god as a son because these are pictures that we can understand all of us have had a father some of us have had a son uh, and we know those sort of pictures we can see those we can feel them but the spirit is much more vague and intangible others may know a lot about the holy spirit but we're rather hesitant we've heard about all sorts of extraordinary things um being attributed to the holy spirit and we're rather scared of that sort of thing we want to keep our distance and perhaps others react against the idea that God acts, might actually work through his spirit today. And perhaps some seek to argue that the spirit acted in a supernatural way uh, through his first apostles, through Jesus' first apostles, but that, that was then, and he doesn't do it today. So over the next three weeks, uh, our Sunday sermons are going to focus on the Holy Spirit. We're going to be asking three questions. Firstly, who the Spirit is this morning. Uh, next week, uh, Simon's going to be speaking what the Holy Spirit does and the week after how the Holy Spirit builds. So this morning, it's who is the Holy Spirit. And apologies to Simon, because there may be some overlap between who he is and what he does. Um, but it works two ways, actually. If Simon doesn't agree with what I say this morning then he's got the right to correct me next week. <laughs> but as, as we start, I want to make uh, uh, three comments. Yeah. Our question is who, rather than what, is the Holy Spirit? Because our belief is that the Spirit is a person rather than a thing. And that's not immediately obvious from our, from our scriptures. Uh, the metaphors used of the spirit are often things and we've sung about some of them this morning fire wind a dove or a liquid uh, we talk about the spirit being poured out and people being filled with the spirit that's a liquid metaphor but i think if we study what the new testament writers said about the spirit the overwhelming evidence is that they, that they considered the spirit as a person rather than a thing. Look at the verbs that um, the Apostle Paul uses to describe the activity of the Spirit. The Spirit searches, he knows, he teaches, he dwells, he gives life, he cries out, he bears witness, he helps, he works, he strengthens, he grieves. Those are just some of the verbs that Paul uses uh, when he talks about the activity of the Spirit, and they're all actions of a person rather than a thing or an object. So it's who is the Holy Spirit, not what is the Holy Spirit. And secondly, I think we need to come to questions like this with, with a degree of humility, because we're talking about God here, Almighty God. We're, we're his creatures. We're the ones he has made. And we can only hope to understand anything about the nature of God if he chooses to reveal it to us. We can't work out God for ourselves. We only may end up by making a God with a small g in our image, an idol, if you like. But we believe that he has spoken to us. He has revealed himself. through what he has said as recorded in our Bibles. And therefore, we must base our understanding of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, on what we read in the Bible. And thirdly, I want to say that we are not the first to struggle to answer the question, who is the Spirit? And I believe we can learn a lot 
from those who thought about the question in the past. Uh, when, the, when the 300 leaders of the class of the church gathered together in Nicaea in 325 AD to set out what, what is authentic Christian faith, what Christians believe, uh, the Holy Spirit only, got, only barely got a mention, just five words at the end. They believed, and in the Holy Ghost. And I think that's understandable, looking back, because their focus at that time was on making it crystal clear that Jesus was divine, God the Son. But over the next few years, um, there was plenty of argument about the Spirit. And there were those who argued that the Spirit was secondary to the Father and the Son. It wasn't sort of the Trinity, it was more of a, a binity, a binary. Um, and they even had a name for this group, the, the pneumatomachi, the pneumatomachi. Um, and they argued, for example, that whenever the Father and the Son and the Spirit are mentioned in the Bible, the Spirit always comes third. And they said, look, the Spirit is referred to as a gift. And a gift is always inferior to the giver. So they argued that the Spirit wasn't quite the same as the Father and the Son. But, but their arguments failed. Um, in 375 AD, Basil the Great, St. Basil, um, published a book on the Holy Spirit, arguing from Scripture that the Spirit was divine, part of God, one of the three persons of the Trinity. He published his book on the Holy Spirit. It's still available on Amazon, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't know who gets the royalties. But, um, and his arguments won the day. And the creed was amended uh, and expanded uh, uh, in 381 uh, to say this about the, the Spirit. And in the, we believe, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and Son is together worshipped and together glorified, who spoke through the prophets. And that is the traditional belief of the church concerning who the Spirit is. He is the Lord. He has the same authority as the Father and the Son. And he is the giver of life the life giver. And this, this isn't the, the, the belief of a few eccentric old men who lived many centuries ago and didn't really understand the world around them. This is the conclusion of the leaders of the church at that time. And many of them knew their Bibles much better than any of us. Many of them could study the, the scriptures in their original languages, in Greek and Hebrew. And, and I think it fair to say that if we were all locked together in this place for 300 years studying our Bibles, <laughs> perish the thought. <laughs> um, but if we were, then we would come to the same conclusions. We would come up with the same doctrines. God is one, but in three persons. Well, we've only got time this morning to look at a tiny fraction of what the Bible has to say about the Spirit. But I want to look at some of these passages to, together. Um, but first I want to ask a question to make sure that we're all still awake. Who is the first person in the Bible who is described as filled with God's Spirit? Well, it was this guy. Bezalel, son of Ur, the first person in the Bible to be described as filled with the Spirit. This is the time Moses had led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, uh, and God had told him to build a tabernacle. And so we read, Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for working gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. That might surprise us, mightn't it? 
but he is the first to be t to be described as filled with the spirit might surprise us because we think of the spirit being associated with the prophets proclaiming god's message or with miraculous deeds and of course that is a big part of what the spirit does he enables people to understand and speak his message so for instance in uh, micah one of the prophets this is what micah has to say but as for me i am filled with power with the spirit of the lord and with justice and might to declare to jacob his transgression and to israel his sin so the spirit enabled people enabled these prophets to declare God's word to the people. So the understanding of, of God's spirit in the Old Testament, I want to suggest, is much wider than we probably, uh, our first thoughts, would have. And Jesus' first followers, I think, in the New Te the, who, who wrote the New Testament, had this wider concept of the spirit. Um, so let, let's... Uh, jump back into the Old Testament for a while. The word for spirit in uh, the Hebrew language in, in which the Old Testament was written is, is the word ruach. You have to sort of express it in your throat. I'm not very good at that. Ruach. And the same word was used for a, a number of different English words. Um, it's used for spirit. So right at the second verse in the Bible says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Ruach of God hovered over the waters. But we also meet the same word in the next chapter of Genesis when we read about God creating Adam. We read, Then the Lord God formed a man, that's Adam, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living be being. The word breath is also ruach. So God breathed into Adam the ruach of life. So it's two things, spirit and breath. But there's a third thing. Ruach is, is also uh, tr translated wind. So remember when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and they was, there was a Red Sea as a barrier and, and God, it says, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. Again, the word for wind is ruach. So when we, when we look out of the window and see the wind rustling the leaves on the trees, we, as sophisticated 21st century people know that it's uh, because of the passage of molecules uh, of air moving from a high pressure to a low pressure. At least uh, probably we do. <laughs> um, um, but in Old Testament times, they didn't understand that. This was the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God, uh, moving these things. And they knew that breath was essential to life. Uh, they may not have understood, uh, like we do, about how oxygen gets absorbed in the blood and transported to the muscles. But they did know that breath was essential to life. When someone, or some person or animal, stopped breathing, then they died. So they had this concept, this Old Testament understanding, the Ruach of God, was what gave life, what animated God's creation, what was essential to life. And I think that's the background to what the writers of the New Testament thought about God's spirit. It gives life. We need it to live spiritually. So when Paul addresses people in Athens, uh, this is uh, after Jesus had died, uh, recorded in the book we call the Acts of the Apostles, he says to them, he, that's God himself, gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So firstly, God's Holy Spirit 
is what gives Christians spiritual life. Just as the Old Testament understanding was that God's Ruach gave everything life, God's Spirit is what gives us spiritual life. Without the Spirit, we're dead. We may have an academic belief in God and Jesus, but we need God's Spirit in us to make it true to our experience. There is one example, I think, in the New Testament of followers of Jesus who not yet received the Holy Spirit, but I believe that that's presented to us as an exception to the general rule. The teaching of the New Testament is that when anyone turns to Christ, they receive his Holy Spirit. So that's the, the first thing I wanted to say about the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is. He is the one who brings life. The giver of life in the language of that original creed. But I want to say uh, three more things about who the Holy Spirit. Um, so secondly, and rather similarly, I want to say that the Spirit of God's, the Spirit is God's presence in us. But I want to get, jump back to Moses again in the Old Testament. When the, when the people rebelled against God in the wilderness, God said that because of their sin, he would send an angel to guide them to the promised land. But God himself, he himself, wouldn't go with them. And Moses pleads with them, we need your presence with us. And Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else would distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Moses understood that God's presence was vital to their survival, but they couldn't live effectively without his presence. And the concept of God's presence with his people carries on through the Old Testament. So we read that God fills the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle and later the temple that Solomon built with a cloud to signify his glory and his presence. God's presence sustained the people. It gave them strength and peace and hope. The idea of presence is important. When we lose a loved one, or a close friend moves away, how we miss their presence with us. Not long after Val and I were married, which is a long time ago, <laughs> I had to make a business trip to Libya, which wasn't a pleasant place uh, even 40 years ago. Colonel Gaddafi was in charge. I was there with my boss, and on the way back coming home, on the way to the airport, we stopped the car, went and had some lunch, and while we were having lunch, our passports were stolen. Getting a new passport is not too difficult, it's fairly easy, but, well, we're all familiar with countries where you go to where you need a visa to get in, and in countries like Libya, you need a visa to get out. Nobody leaves Libya without an exit visa. And we were working for the... Libyan Navy at the time, and, and there was a, a degree of suspicion, I suppose, that, um, that we'd lost not only our passports, but various documents related to the Libyan Navy. So we visited various police stations, and government offices, um, trying to get permission to leave, not knowing what was going on or how long we'd been sat there. I never this, I don't think I ever told about, but I remember when it first happened, my boss turned to me and said, we could be here for months. <laughs> and it was a fairly unnerving experience. Um, if, if I'd been on there on my own, <laughs> I would have been terrified, I think. But I wasn't on my own. I was with there with my boss, who was a very experienced traveler and a great companion and a great guy. And because I was with him, because of his presence, it was okay. And about a week later, we were allowed to leave. Good news. Um, but imagine what it must have been like for Jesus' disciples. 
They'd been with him, traveling with him in difficult and dangerous situations, in situations where his life was under threat. They'd traveled together, they'd worked together, they'd eaten together, they'd slept together on the roadside, they'd lived together. They were sustained by his presence. And then suddenly one day, he tells them that he's not going to be around for much longer. He's going to leave them. What would they, must they have felt like? They would have been gutted, devastated, wouldn't they? What on earth were they going to do without him? How on earth would they be able to continue to do what he trained them to do without his presence with them? And that, that's the context uh, of the verses that we read in John's Gospel, the context in which he says to them, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. The word on the screen, when we read it earlier, was counsellor. If you look at other English translations, it might be comforter and sometimes helper. But we don't have a, one English word that does the trick, really. I will give you another comforter to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The spirit that God would send would be the equivalent of what Jesus' presence had been to them. So, so equivalent, but a, a couple of verses later, he says, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. So instead of the Spirit, he's talking about Jesus himself coming to them. But he means in the form of his Spirit. The Spirit living in them was going to be equivalent to Jesus' presence with them. And I think that's the same for us. If we're followers of Jesus, he sends his spirit to live in us, to be the presence of God with us. And it's so equivalent that Paul can sometimes change the vocabulary and refer to Christ living in him or in us rather than the spirit. So that's, that's the second thing I wanted to say about who is the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus living in us, giving us the strength and the wisdom and the perseverance to follow him and become more like him. And that's seen in the New Testament both as a collective thing, as a spirit living in his church, as his gathered people, and as an individual thing, God's presence in you and in me. So the Spirit gives us spiritual life. The Spirit is God's presence in us. But I also want to look at a third facet of who the Spirit is. This is the artist Charlie Mackesy of um, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse fame, if you know the book. Uh, but he's devoted a lot of his uh, artistic life to depictions of the prodigal son, and specifically... Um, to that moment in the story when the father sees his son, his starving, half-dead son, returning and runs to him and embraces him. And I think we can see this depiction on a number of levels. We can see it as the moment in the story when the father sees his son returning and embraces him. That's one level. But I think maybe we can also see ourselves in the sculpture. Maybe we have rebelled against God. Maybe we've chased after all sorts of alternatives and idols. And when we've exhausted ourselves, and when we've realized that they don't lead anywhere, we return home and we're welcomed. Maybe we can see ourselves in that picture. But I think there's also a third way. We can also see it as the love between God the Father and God the Son. God the Father, as he embraces the Son who has willingly laid down his life for the world, for us, and raises him to life again. And I think maybe Jesus had that image also in mind as he told the story. If you remember the story in Luke 15, the father says, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. Well, he wasn't dead, was he, in the story? But Jesus was dead and raised to life again. 
And if we look at it in this way, it depicts the love between the Father and the Son, God the Father and God the Son. And that love is the very heart of who God is. God is love. We can't get behind that to a, a sort of God without that love. It is the very essence of God, that love. And if this is a picture of, of God the Father and God the Son, where, where's the Holy Spirit in it? Well, I think he is there as the love between the Father and the Son, and as the one who draws us in to experience that same love of the Father. And this, the second reading that was read to us, where Paul writes to the Christians in Rome, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Who was it who called God Abba? Well, it was Jesus, wasn't it? That Abba mean, is that intimate word for father, daddy, if you like. It was Jesus himself who has used that intimate expression when he talked to God. And the Spirit draws us into that same intimate relationship with God the Father that Jesus enjoyed. Not separately, I think, but together with Christ. Together with Christ, we can come and enjoy that love that God has for his children. Done. And I think we see that in a John Calvin, the great Protestant reformer, wrote, the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectively unites us to himself. And as he unites us to himself, we, his adopted sons and daughters, are drawn into the same love for God the Father as for God the Son. So the Spirit is the one who gives life. He's God's presence permanently in us. And in Christ, he draws us in to experience that same love, the same love that, that God the Father has for his Son. Let me say one, one last thing about about the, who the Spirit is, before I bring things to a close. In his letters, Paul uses a couple of metaphors to talk about the Spirit, which I think are important also for our understanding. He refers to the Spirit as the first fruits. So again, to, writing to the Christians in Rome, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of their bodies. When we see the first fruits, when we see, see the first blackberries or strawberries on the bush, uh, we can pick them, can't we, and enjoy them. But they're more than that. They're a sign that there's much more to come. The first fruits are a sign that there's going to be a harvest. Um, and likewise, the Spirit, God's presence in us, is something to be enjoyed now, but it is also a point to the, to the time when we're going to be fully in God's presence. And as the Apostle John writes, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Or we shall see him as he is. So the Spirit is first fruits. And Paul also uses an, another metaphor in a similar vein. It refers to the Spirit as a deposit. You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. If I borrowed a hundred quid from you, I'm not, I'm not seeking to do that, but if I did, um, well, I could give you an IOU, and that would be some sort of comfort that I was going to pay you back. But you'd be much more comforted, I think, if I actually paid you ten quid back as a deposit. You'd be more confident that you'd see the rest of the money. And what's more, the £10 will be useful. You could go and spend it. So Paul likens the spirit to a deposit. It's a guarantee of our inheritance. It's a guarantee that we are going to be with Christ when he returns. But it's also valuable now. It's another helper. 
another comforter as we seek to follow him. I'm coming to a close, but I want to say something before we close about the importance of the Spirit in our life as in the church and as individuals. Uh, the Anglican Church is pretty good at keeping statistics. These are a little bit out of date, and you probably you can't read the, the writing, so I'm going to have to explain. These are, this is church attendance. On the left is children under 14. And the purple on the, the left-hand column is, was in 1979. The pink on the right is in 2005. Okay? And that's people under 14, and it goes up with age groups 15 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 34, 45 to 64, and greater than 65. And the greater than 65, you see on the left, in 1979, they made up a bit over 20% of attendance, attendees. In 2005, it's nearly up to 40%. And the figures are a bit out of date, but I suspect the trend is continuing. If we have more recent figures, I think they'd show that the trend would continue. Um, and what's more, I think if we have statistics for other denominations, we'd likely see a similar trend. Less and less young people attending church, and the average age of a congregation steadily increasing. But that's not so in all sectors of the church. Some sectors are growing, and in, in general, and it's not universal, but in general, those who are growing, the denominations and the churches are growing, who are growing are the Pentecostal denomination and the more charismatic parts of other denominations, the parts which give greater prominence to the Holy Spirit. Because just as the Holy Spirit is the giver of life to us as individual Christians, so he is the giver of life to Christians collectively as a church. Without the Spirit, the church will not grow. One of the patriarchs of the Orthodox Church in Antioch wrote this sometime in the last century. Christ belongs to the past. The gospel is a dead letter. The church is a mere organization. Mission is turned into propaganda. But in the Spirit, God is near. The risen Christ is present here and now. The gospel is the power of life. The church signifies Trinitarian communion. Mission is the expression of Pentecost. Without the Spirit, we're dead. Now, we've probably all heard about or even experienced situations in churches where I think people have got the balance wrong and the focus is on seeking all sorts of weird and wonderful experiences for the sake of impressing others rather than building up the church and reaching out into the community. But I think we need to be very careful that we don't swing to the other extreme where the work of the Spirit is suppressed. Because if we do, we become dead. Do we really expect the Spirit to be at work when we meet together? What do we expect as we gather as a church on a Sunday or in our growth groups? A few good songs and a, perhaps a thought-provoking sermon and a nice chat over coffee? Or do we meet together expecting God through his Spirit to act, to speak to us? to convict us of sin and selfishness, to change us so that we do become more like Jesus, so that we do become more effective as channels of his love. Do we expect God to give us his wisdom so that we can make sensible choices and wise decisions in life? Do we expect God to heal? And I'm not necessarily talking about miracles, though they may happen. But we all come within our hurts and anxieties and griefs. 
Do we believe that the Spirit of God can work in us and deliver us from these issues and heal our hearts and minds? We come conscious of our weaknesses, don't we? Do we expect that the Spirit of God can empower us and give us strength? Or, or are we content just to carry on muddling along? Do we really believe Jesus promised that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I with them? Do we sense the presence of Christ in image through his Spirit? Or do we see our gatherings just as meetings together with like-minded friends? Do we expect that God will add to our numbers those who are being saved, just as he did after the Spirit was poured out at Pentecost? Or have we lost our faith in his ability to build his church through the enabling of his Spirit? If we're going to grow as a church, not, not just in numbers, but in becoming more like Jesus, then I believe we need to be open to the presence and the work of his Spirit. And the Spirit is a gift, and we need to ask God for that gift, to invite the Spirit into our lives collectively and individually. Let's, let's pray. Father, we confess that we're pretty poor disciples. Um, we don't love you as we ought to. And we don't love our neighbours as ourselves. Father, we need the strength of your spirit in us to help us to become more like Jesus. Pray that you would fill us with your spirit so that we might be truly the people who you want us to be. For Jesus' sake. Amen.